Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1975 Italian giallo film, Strip Nude for Your Killer, and yes, it is one I currently own, because if you've watched enough of my giallo reviews, you know I'm a big fan of Edwige Fenech, the very well-known for giallo actress from the time period, and uh, had to have this one, Strip Nude for Your Killer, because it's kind of shown up on lists of like, if you're into Edwige Fenech, you must own this one. So there you go, Strip Nude for Your Killer by Arrow Video. Now, this isn't like the best Giallo film. In fact, it's on the lower end of my full list I'm keeping for myself of Giallo films I've seen. Uh, but it's still fun. It's still worth seeing, and I'm sure I'll rewatch it again. Not just for Edwige, but just because I'm so into Giallo. And I, I do have to say, as a side note, I was... I watched the film and then I realized, man, I didn't realize how much Giallo films increased my mood. Because <laughs> I'd watched a horror film, I mean, horror films increased my mood overall, but I'd watched a horror film the day before, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, I feel a little bit better. But then I watched Strip Nude for Your Killer, and I was just like, man, that just puts me in such a great mood. And it's just something that Giallo does to me. I don't know. It's weird. It's just like fun and quirky, and I don't know. It just makes me feel better. Anyway, uh, Strip Nude for Your Killer was directed by Andrea Bianchi, who also did some films such as What the Peeper Saw, Cry of a Prostitute, Confessions of a Frustrated Housewife, Burial Ground, The Nights of Terror, Maniac Killer, Massacre, and listen to this title, Fleshy Doll. That's such a weird title. Uh, it was written by Bianchi and also Massimo Felisati, uh, who also wrote scripts for The Weekend Murders, The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave, one of my least favorite uh, Giallo films, even below Strip Nude for Your Killer, Shadows Unseen, and Violence for Kicks. Uh, now, something you need to know about this is uh, Felisati put Bianchi on the writing credits because he didn't want to have to take responsi full responsibility for the script quality, <laughs> apparently. So apparently Falsati actually wrote the script, got some input story-wise from Bianchi, and it was just like, I'm putting Bianchi's name on this too because I don't want to be the one that everyone points at and says, this story's dumb because this film is super light on plot. Uh, this has actually been considered the perfect kind of bridge film to move from giallo films to American slasher films because of how focused on sex and violence this film is, but also how bare minimum the plot and story is with this film. So, yeah, uh, a lot of people have said that this kind of follows the giallo formula to the T, which makes sense because it's actually coming in 1975, which is a year after kind of the popularity of giallo quit. I mean, the peak time for Giallo films is like 1970 to 1974. So they're in 75 at this point. There's been so much Giallo. So you would assume if they're putting Giallo out, they're definitely following the formula at that point, just hoping to hold on to something some audience members might find in the Giallo genre still. So very interesting. Now, like I said, Edwige Fenech is in this film, and she was in other Giallo films and uh, other horror films such as your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, All the Colors of the Dark, The Case of the Bloody Iris, Anna, The Pleasure of the Torment, Five Dolls for an August Moon, Phantom of Death, and yes, a very small part in Hostel Part 2, which I own and I need to go back and watch just to see Edwige's little appearance in that because I can't, when I read that, I was like, I don't remember her being in there but I didn't really know who she was at that point when I saw it last, so yeah. Um, the theme song for this in, that plays in the beginning and the end is actually was made intentionally to sound like the song Papa Was a Rolling Stone by The Temptations, so if you rewatch this or if you think back to that, just think about Papa Was a Rolling Stone and you know pair that song up with it because, yeah, y you can see it. All right, so getting into the film, I said, well, uh, starting a film with an abortion scene and shot in such an exploitative way certainly lets, the, lets you know what the film is all about, and it really does. It really sets the tone for saying, you know, hey, we're, we're going right for the sleaze. There's going to be a lot of nudity. It's going to be a very lurid film, and there was a ton, a ton of nudity in this, probably the most nudity I've seen in any Giallo film I've seen at this point, and I'm approaching 50 Giallo films that I've seen 
Uh, so yeah, I think this one is at the top as far as the most nudity. Not that I care about that, you know, that was the time period. I know I've said this during other Giallo reviews, but one of the big reasons there was so much nudity put into these films was because it was better for uh, international distribution. Specifically, apparently, Japan was the main market that really wanted nudity in these films, and they'd sell so much better if you had a lot of nudity, so just saying. I'm unclear on how the cover-up of Eveline's death is actually supposed to work. Don't you think that a coroner would not think that she died from a heart attack in the tub? Additionally, he, do you think that the coroner would actually not see the evidence of the botched abortion? Because that's the whole thing. Like, the botched abortion happened. She dies on the operating table. Then they just put her in a bathtub with the water running, which is how we get the noise for the killer of the water running every time the killer's going to kill or planning on killing. But, and I get that, like, I get that setup, but here's the thing. They're just like, oh, we'll cover up the death this way. But a coroner is going to do their job on, on this woman, on the, on the dead body. And they would, A, probably figure out she didn't just die of a heart attack in a tub, especially with her being young. And B, would see evidence of the botched abortion, most likely, when they do their postmortem. So, it doesn't really make sense, and this goes back to the whole thing that this film was very much chided for when it first came out, which is not a great story, very light on plot, just seems like it's driven by the violence and the sex. But at the same time, I feel like that's what a lot of people were looking for in Giallo films, especially back then. I mean, people are still looking for that in the films now. Oh, I don't like the sound of the killer's breathing. That's one of the big things that kind of hit me with this film. Every time you see the killer with the, with the helmet on, the motorcycle helmet on, just the breathing it gets so annoying. But then also that kind of weird hokey noise like, I know that sounds terrible. It sounds nothing like it, but you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm trying to get at. That weird noise that's almost kind of like slapsticky bell type noise when the killer's going to kill. I'm like, who thought to use this music? It's terrible. Carlo is established very well as a straight-up horn dog and a super creep in, in this film. When he first meets Lucio, uh, uh, Lucia, and he is harassing the hell out of her by taking pictures, but mainly just, like, looking at her butt. Uh, and then he, like, borderline rape, tries to rape her in the sauna, and it's just like, this guy's terrible. And he's actually supposed to be kind of one of the heroes of the film, so... There's not really a whole lot to feel good about with this movie as far as characters go. And there's just a lot of that. There's a lot of just, like, horrible people in the film. I mean, I think probably the person who I was most uh, feeling okay with was probably Magda. You know, Ed Wieschvenek's character of Magda. Uh, but Carlo, oh, no, 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 no. Terrible. And, I mean, I mean, your initial introduction to him, it's just like, ooh, this guy. They drop all music when Mario sneaks into the photo lab. Notice that. Uh, it kicks back in when you're hearing the noise of the killer coming for Mario, uh, which, you know, he doesn't know at that time, obviously. But that's that's another thing to kind of point out, that every single time there's the killer is about to get someone, they drop the music completely. And they just use sound design and they use silence to kind of build the tension because it really does create this air of just like you sitting silently waiting to find out when the kill will happen because you know it's coming. Um, and I think it works. I think it's a great way to drive tension up. And I wish more films would do stuff like this. You know, this isn't a great film, like I was saying, but there are great things that it does, including this idea of dropping the music when the kills are coming. I love it. Why are Mario's pants down when he's found dead? That's something that's never revealed. Uh, unless they were trying to frame it, because there is a there is a um, a comment made about him not being into women. So I don't know if that was supposed to insinuate that the killer set it up to make it look like maybe it was a spurned lover who they were about to be getting it on and then they just killed him. I don't know if that's what it was, but it wasn't like specifically talked about and I just thought it was funny because you just see the crime scene and you're just like why are his pants off like they weren't even off they were like down around his his knees basically it's like why are his pants down uh yeah so I just thought that was kind of funny wow Gisela is real domineering 
when she had just made love to Lucia, and then she basically orders her to stay in bed and wait for her when she, while she's go to, goes to work. Like, she literally makes a comment to her about, like, this is what you do, and this is what I do. I go out, I have my life, I have my job, and then I just come home to you, and you just kind of serve my needs. So I think they, were, they did that to kind of really set Gisela up as a very masculine personality of the time, because she ends up matching up a lot with uh, Carlo and also Maurizio in being, you know, horrible basically, which it does make sense for her character too, because she does have to be more cutthroat because of her being the head of Albatross, that company that for what I can figure out is just like a ad company or like they create like sexy photos or I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really get the full thing on that. Um, how about Carlo's naked headstand after the first time he sleeps with Magda at his place, not counting the blowjob in the photo lab, uh, after he f sleeps with Mag Magda at his, at, I think that was his place, or maybe it was her, no, it was her place, actually. Um, he, you turn around at one point, and he's on the bed doing a headstand with his legs up against the wall, and he's butt naked. So that's one of the things I'll say for this film. This isn't just a typical giallo film where it's got a lot of nudity for the ladies, uh, or I'm, for, I'm sorry, for the men. It's It's got nudity for the ladies in this too. And gay men and gay women. You know, it's it's got something for everyone as far as carnal desires go. So good on them for that. As soon as Carlos started strangling Magda after she asked about Lucia and kind of Carlos' a relationship with Lucia since she had died... Um, I was like, okay, this is, you know, Carlo is now the guy that they're going to really start riding as far as this is who you should be thinking as an audience member is the killer. This is who we want you to think the killer is. That, I mean, that's what that whole action of him starting to choke Magna was all about. And I think he does that on another occasion too, like playing around. It's like this guy has a disgusting sixth sense of what playing around is and joking around. And I'll get back to that with the final thing in the film too. It's weird. Uh, wow, Maurizio is really is a really crazy driver, and I love that scene where Doris gets in the car with him, uh, and he's gonna take him to or take her to his place, and it just shows like the POV of Doris's uh, side, like watching his crazy driving as he's just like flying through the streets. They shot it really well. It looked super dangerous, so it conveyed exactly what it was supposed to, and I just I don't know. It was cool. I love that part. I was like, man, Maurizio is an awful driver. I thought that Carlo was awful. Maurizio is is potentially even worse because he tries to rape Doris, threatens her with violence, and then when she finally relents and kind of acts like she's into it, he starts crying on her, and then he starts uh, saying that he's never had sex with a woman before. And I was like, I don't understand. He's got a wife. I mean, I believe that... Who is it? I think it's um, Gisela is his wife, right? Tell me if I'm wrong in the comments. Can you explain this one to me? I don't. I didn't get that, how he was like crying about that. And he's like, I've never had sex with a woman. I'm like, wait a minute. But then uh, we get the best thing ever, ever. When Doris finally leaves and Maurizio goes and pulls a blow-up doll out of a dresser drawer, is walking around in just his underwear holding this blow-up doll like he's clinging to it for emotional support, basically. Like, he's in love with this blow-up doll. I think he even makes a comment about, like, you're the only one who can make me come to the blow-up doll. <laughs> I'm just like, this is this is grade-A quirky ridiculousness for a Giallo film. Uh, I love that. I laughed pretty hard at that scene. Probably the best line of the film. Did I ever tell you you look terrible with clothes on. I've heard iterations of that, but that specific phrasing of it, wonderful. So funny. Great line right there. I believe Carlo is... Did Carlo, Carlo said that to Magda? I think. I think. I might be wrong. Can't say I feel sorry for Carlo when he gets hit by the car. I actually kind of laughed at that part as well. Especially since he just watched and took pictures of Gisela getting stabbed. So he is this... I already talked about this. He is this kind of hero in the film, yet he's a horrible person who almost rapes someone, who's just like a horn dog, who just womanizes. 
uh, which the womanizing part was actually not seen as all that bad back then in the 70s, but uh, obviously is now. Um, but then he also just like literally is just taking pictures of Gisela getting stabbed. Doesn't try to really help or anything. He literally sees her about to get stabbed and just starts taking pictures. I understand he was trying to solve the case of who the killer is, but you could have saved a life, buddy. Carlo, you're horrible. He is awful. So was the killer actually trying to get Magda? Because they were walking very slowly and she was in a car. I actually got the sense that Magda was being spared by Patrizia. Is that who the killer is in the end? Yes. Okay, Patrizia. Um, I got the idea that, she, that Magda was actually being spared because of that scene where Magda goes out to her car and the killer is there. Patrizia is there in her full killer outfit. And she's walking after the car and then she starts driving away in it. Then she stops and she like gets out and like flips off that um that kind of like spike strip type thing and then keeps going because she just kept slowly walking. Patrizia did so it's like she, it didn't seem like she was actually going after her. And then the scene where D I believe Doris and Stefano Stefano end up getting killed and then for some reason Magda is there and she's like hammered drunk in the same house or the or apartment. And I'm like, how is she not dead? Because, I, I don't know. And I think maybe that was just done to kind of place some suspicion on her at the same time. And be like, oh no, she just got drunk and killed him. Or she's just acting drunk and she's actually the killer. Something like that. But um, that just made me think then that Patricia actually had no intention of really killing Magda. She didn't think that she had anything to do with her sister's death. So yeah. Uh, there are some large segments that kind of drag in this, uh, especially toward the end of the film. There is kind of like this aimless feeling to it at many parts where they're just kind of like wait, trying to waste time until they get to the next moment where they feel like they want to drop a kill or some sort of sex scene or like a little hint as to who the killer is. Uh, and as I was supposed to, I totally forgot about Stefano. Uh, I forgot he existed. I also forgot that Patricia existed, which uh, I guess makes sense because the only, the really last time you see Patricia um, before she's actually revealed as the killer was in a scene with Stefano. So if I forgot about Stefano, then it makes sense that I forgot about Patricia. Note that each time a kill is about to happen, water starts running. That's another thing. And many times there are flashes of Eveline in the tub from the beginning. This is to indicate the murders are tied to the revenge of Eveline's death. So you're actually getting these little clues early in the film and throughout the film with those kind of flashes worked in there and the running water. So obviously auditorially taking it back to that initial scene and then visually getting those flashes, taking it back to that scene of Eveline in the tub with the staged um, heart attack in the tub which makes no sense. Um, what is with the rear entry joke at the end of the film? This is another Carlo thing. I don't understand Carlo. Carlo's such a weird dude. He's very frantic. He's very all over the place. Very Jekyll and Hyde. And he makes that joke at the end about rear entry with Magda. And like, that's how they end the film. It's such a weird way to end the film. But then again, Giallo. Quirky, giallo there's always some sort of wacky left field or numerous wacky left field things in these films like many italian films of this time mirrors get used a lot in shots notice that there are many times where they would start a shot focusing on a mirror and then move or move over to the character or vice versa so mirrors were used a lot which is very very common also shots of people through things mainly in this one house plants a big favorite of Bianchi, Andrea Bianchi, for this film was shooting characters through houseplants. Okay, got it. Um, I do like it when they shoot through objects, but consistently using something like a houseplant, just a little bit weird, just a little bit odd to me. Anyway, <clears throat> my initial guess for who the killer was, by the way, was Magda. Um, and part of the reason I thought this is because Edwige usually doesn't have short hair in her films, and so I thought that it was an intentional choice that she have short hair because then it wouldn't be seen underneath the helmet. It wouldn't, like, poke out at the bottoms. So that's why I had the indicator for me. I was like, ooh, maybe it's Magna. But it ended up not being Magna. Uh, so I'm glad for that because I, I like not knowing. 
I like guessing and then finding out I'm dead wrong. <clears throat> so anyway, biggest thing with this film, I wish it wasn't as aimless as it is. And like I said, it's toward the bottom of the list for Giallo films for me, but it's still a good time. So out of five stars with half stars in play, uh, I'm going to give it a two star rating. I still enjoy it enough. I thought I was between two and two and a half, but I feel like it makes more sense at a two star because there is some good technical stuff like I talked about. But yeah, it's very sex and violence driven without a whole lot of substance to it. And the motivation of Patricia as the killer, like, it makes sense, but it's not really interesting. So I'm looking for Giallo to be interesting, especially since this one came out kind of after Giallo had been done being popular. Like, you feel like if you're going to put out a Giallo at that point, you should go even bigger. You should make sure it's super interesting. So I don't know. But like I said before, this is viewed as the perfect bridge film between Giallo and and the American Slasher film. And I see it. I definitely see it. So I would love to hear your takes on this film. Go ahead and put your comments down there. Love it, hate it, all the things in between. I also have a lot of other Giallo uh, reviews on my page, or on my page, on my channel, uh, including an entire playlist of Giallo reviews. So go ahead and check that out. There's 40 some at this point when I'm doing this. So there's plenty to watch. Um, and yeah, do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you have, thank you very much. If you haven't, please do it. It literally takes a second, costs you nothing, totally painless, and it means a lot to me. It keeps me motivated to keep doing these and lets me know that I'm growing this nerdy horror community that I've been trying to create here. So I'd appreciate that. Also, hit that notification bell button because then that way you'll know whenever I'm, I'm putting up a new review, whether it's a Giallo review or some other film or one of my you know, no spoilers, reviews, or unboxings, or haul videos, or any of that. But, regardless, I really do thank you for checking this out, taking your time to do that. Until next time, keep it brutal.